Welcome everyone to another episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech, content and wisdom from the world of marketing. Let me introduce you to my co-host. He is a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing, the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. Here is Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you very much. And what a pleasure it is to spend more time with a man who is also on a mission to keep marketing simple. You are the voice of the marketing and finance podcast and the host of the Rod's Vlog video series. I give you Mr. Roger Edwards. Thanks, Pascal. Always a pleasure to sit here and talk marketing with you. So shall we get straight into it? Let's go to the in the news section. So let's get straight into the news this week. Deliveroo customers in Whitechapel, London, were given the chance to win a free pair of Adidas trainers and an edible replica crafted out of cake. (laughs) That's so funny. Well, BrewDog, the self-styled punk brewery, has teamed up with Dogs on the Streets and All Dogs Matter. This was inspired by Ricky Gervais on Twitter. All profit from the sale of the street dog beer will be split evenly between the two charities. Another beer, Stella Artois, has created a virtual experience called Hotel Artois at Home to bring you the services of a five-star hotel stay, including a wake-up call from actor Liev Schreiber and room service from Eva Longoria. Listen to this, Roger. Engineers in the UK and Japan have broken all internet speed records by clocking an incredible 178 terabytes per second. That would be enough to download all the films on Netflix within seconds. Wow, I think we're going to have to wait a while for BT to catch up with that one, Pascal. (laughs) An update to the Lightroom app for iPhone and iPad deleted years of users' photos and other data not synced to the cloud. All Adobe could offer for this blunder was an apology. Oh dear. Well, Facebook is testing new analytics and insights feature for Facebook groups, giving social media marketers a more detailed look at the behavior of their active members. According to a recent Ofcom survey, social media continues to be the lowest rated news source on trust. Facebook is the least trustworthy at 32% and Twitter the most at 39%. And finally, the annual Women in Marketing Awards has introduced a new category for the first time in its 10-year history, the PR Communicator of the Year, to recognize the important role of public relations during the global pandemic. Once again, some fascinating news stories there. And Pascal, my eye's always going to be drawn to beer. (laughs) Always going to be drawn to beer. And Brewdog. Do you know, BrewDog are doing some quite innovative stuff at the moment, aren't they? Uh, it's quite reactive. I think, I think that they, uh, you know, the, when Dominic Cummings did his um, famous little trip to Barnard Castle, uh, they introduced a beer within about a week, Barnard Castle beer. And, and here again, they're, 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 they're teaming up with a, a fairly high profile star uh, and creating a special beer and obviously the charitable connection here is is pretty impressive as well i like the way they're just so present and and you know timely with with their campaigns i mean you mentioned dominic cummins there was also the recent um aldi little uh kerfuffle where aldi had kind of copied a beer or suddenly they'd copied the packaging of brew dog and brew dog actually launched a beer called yaldi um copying their you know brand and saying you know, perhaps you know this will be on the shelves of aldi very very soon i think what i like about brew dog is that they are true to their to their culture to their spirit and and values and Talk about a hearts and mind campaign. I certainly went ahead and ordered a pack of the street dog beer because, as you know, mm. we love pets. Uh, actually, um, we've been adopted by our neighbor's cats, uh, which <laughs> I think is very, very interesting. But I think, you know, back to this um, PR stroke marketing um, stunts and campaigns, I just like that Bruno does it because it's slightly irreverent, but never to the point where one could get upset or it could be too divisive. I think you're right. It, it, there's, there's humour, obviously, and and some might suggest that they're treading a fine line. You know, if this was in America, there'd be lawsuits flying left, right, and centre. <laughs> but they do seem to just keep it quite amicable, don't they? There's a there's a bit of a back, you know, back slapping, uh, leg pulling 
element to this. And I actually quite like it. And it does really does build their brand and, and make it engaging. No, I would agree. I think uh, they do what I think British companies do best is wit and tongue in cheek. And I think that works really well. Could I perhaps ask for your reaction on the news that you read about the Ofcom survey, whereby social media is deemed to be the least trustworthy source of information? I mean, Facebook is making the headlines very often for all the wrong reasons. Twitter, less so. But 32% of people think that Facebook is the least trustworthy. Um, I I don't know. It's tough, isn't it? Uh, the, in some ways, it's not surprising, I suppose, because social media almost becomes its own little echo chamber, doesn't it? I mean, most of us are guilty of confirmation bias and, and we tend to seek out content and, and opinion that matches our own. So if you're very right-wing in your views, it's likely that you'll seek out right-wing views. Obviously, on the other side of the coin, if you're left-wing, you might s seek out left-wing views. If you have a, an opinion on a certain brand, you know, the aforementioned Brewdog, you'll be able to go onto social media and find lots and lots of content and comments that back up what you think of Brewdog. What you probably don't do is, is go looking for the opposite view um, that you, people might have. And, and I think that that's possibly why a lot of people feel that social media is not trustworthy, because it, it almost becomes polarised, doesn't it? So, you know, people don't really like to see some of the opposite views. But then the other side of the coin is we know that there's been fake news, Cambridge Analytica and, and that debacle. So I think pe people are a little bit suspicious, but maybe that suspicion is just generated by the mainstream media and by the polarising sort of echo chamber effect that you get from social media. And maybe simply a, a maturation effect, uh, Roger, of the use of social media. You know, social mm. media was never a source of news, truthfully. And, and perhaps actually we're going to see a return to people going back to where the news, uh, you know, would be more trusted and trusting. Um, newspaper, I'm thinking, not TV. What has really been delightful for me in terms of this podcast is that it's given me a good reason to go back to the old-fashioned ways of reading marketing articles and reading blog posts and so on, because perhaps, you know, like Benny, I've been caught up in the snacking of content yeah. on social media. And now here I am reading an article that takes me some time at a quarter of an hour and even having to scroll back and go back to the beginning. That's been a while since I've done that. So... Maybe that, that's what um, this is telling us in terms of the Ofcom survey, which is that be careful that there are some platforms whose job it is not to provide news. They maybe give you the headlines, but can you go deeper? And I think that's where Google News is trying to do a better job by giving you access to actually diverse views and diverse opinions within a central theme or central headline. I think uh, social media certainly lends itself to the soundbite, doesn't it? Especially Twitter. And, and we know that a lot of politics these days is, is based around soundbites and get Brexit done, that sort of thing. And it, it just plays straight into social media. But you're right. I think that we probably live in a world now where all of us need to dig a bit deeper into some of the issues that face us, whether it's politics, whether it's social, whether it's um, whether it's content, go a bit deeper and learn a bit more rather than just listening to and being seduced by those soundbite headlines because there's always more to it than you think. So, Pascal, I think we should move on to Content Spotlights. Welcome to this week's Content Spotlight. This is the part of the show where Pascal and I, independently and without telling each other, pick a piece of content that's really grabbed our attention. And we ask each other our opinions on that piece of content. So, Pascal, what have you got for me this week? Well, Roger, no surprise. I've got a long-form article, written article for you this <laughs> week. The author is a chap called Rand Fishkin. Now, you may know the name, and obviously listeners may have come across Rand Fishkin from his days at Moors.com when he was essentially hosting the Whiteboard Fridays video series. And Rand has been essentially, Rand has been a voice of reason and honesty in the world of SEO and other form of online marketing. Now, um, you know, far bit from me to 
suggest that there is a lack of honesty in the world of SEO and digital marketing, but there's definitely noise and misinformation. I would go as far as that, Roger. Mm. And what Rent has done for many, many years now is really give super practical and grounded uh, advice on how to go about reaching out, building a network of contacts that can help you build your brand. Now, um, Rand has left um, Moz some time ago now, I can't remember the date, but he set up a company called Spark Toro. Now, Spark Toro offers a software kind of based solution to help you understand your audience. It offers audience intelligence to know where they go on the web, who they follow, and what content they consume to allow mm. you to formulate a better online strategy. Now, he wrote an article recently called um, Outreach Tips and Tricks That Are Better Than Anything You Can Find on Google. And <laughs> it's given essentially 15 outreach tips and tricks. Now, I'm not going to go through all 15 and understand that because I want to encourage you and our viewers and listeners to go out and read the article. It's superbly written. It's almost like a conversation. You could imagine actually Rand delivering this on stage. But the article begins with this sentence. And I'm actually going to get your reaction. So the, the article begins with, it's 2020, so your inboxes probably look like mine bloated with requests from people you don't know. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely right. My inbox is full of requests from people I don't know. Quite a lot of people pitching to get on my podcast. Quite a lot of people wanting to sell me stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, you and Amy Woods had a bit of a back and forth on Twitter about that very subject because Amy was actually saying, what is going on? You know, I'm getting all these requests from complete strangers about things that, frankly, I'm not interested in or kind of uh, requests for partnership that are really weird because, like I said, you don't know those people. Yeah, it's almost as if, and this happens on social media and, and with email, it's also almost as if people are going through the equivalent of the of the phone book picking people and then just sending them sales messages. So, oh, here's Roger. I'll try and sell him my stuff. Now, it breaks every single marketing rule because you've got to understand your customer first. Who is your customer? What is their issue? And how can I solve their issue better than anybody else? But if you don't know what Roger's about, if you don't know what my problems are, you can't start to sell me stuff because that stuff might not be what I'm currently looking for. And may, maybe it's this, this, this world that we live in at the moment. A lot of people are thinking I may as well just carpet bomb my contact list, whether I know these people or not, and just keep my fingers crossed that some of it will convert even if that conversion rate is 0.01%. It's, uh, yeah. So so what, what does Rand have to say about solving this problem? So to begin with, um, in terms of outreach, it's not the term that I use uh, at all, I think, in my vocabulary, but to explain to our audience, this is the idea of reaching out to people to build a network of referrers, a network of partners as part of your content marketing. So I would call this my visibility tactics, You know, finding mm. the trust network and becoming a participant in that. But in terms of his article, he offers eight tips on the outreach and seven tactics stroke, stroke tricks. So I've picked two um, mm -hmm. tips and two tricks and the rest, please do have a look at the, uh, the article. So um, tip number two, as listed in the article by Rand, ask for things no one else does. So what he's saying is that if you go through your inbox, and almost make a list of all the requests you've received, do the opposite, because this is lazy. <laughs> this is kind of copycat marketing, it's wishful marketing. And what he's suggesting is that novelty, novelty earns the attention. And he has an expression in the article, which you're gonna love, Roger. He says, now make sure that when you obviously contact somebody, potentially via email, avoid what is called the buzzwordish, buzzwordy buzzwords. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that thought, oh, Roger's going to love this. So no, I'm absolutely right. You know what I'm like with um, gobbledygook and buzzwords, Pascal. So avoid the buzzwordish, buzzwordy buzzwords. But ultimately, what he's saying is that the if you ask the same thing as the recent spammers, you're going to be essentially paint with the same you know, brush, so be very careful. 
Number four in the list of eight is suggesting where possible, always, always ask for a warm intro. So instead of doing the direct approach, which is nowadays so easy to do, you can always find someone else's email address, you can find one on Twitter and so on, find a way for somebody else who's connected with them to make the introductions. So that was um, very, very helpful. But in general, around those eight kind of outreach tips is suggesting find a way to be unreasonably kind and helpful to others. And I think that will match, obviously, what you believe in as well, Roger. Yeah, I mean, you, you've seen and you've listened to some of my podcasts and my videos. I have this little mantra that a lot of the time when a new app gets developed or a new platform, the immediate reaction of a certain type of marketer is, how can I use this app or this platform to carpet bomb my Carpet bomb seems to be my favorite word this this episode. Carpet bomb my client base with messages. Whereas we should be saying to ourselves, how can I use this app to help my client base? I'm going to move on to the outreach uh, tricks, the seven of them. Um, again, I picked two for you, Roger. Number okay. four on the list, start a content series that feature guests or highlights their own efforts. Mm. Nice one. I mean, you and I, we've been doing this as practitioners for years and years and years, but I'm still surprised that so many people are still hesitant about doing those guest series. Yes. Yeah, I know. There seems to be so, so, some people are reluctant, aren't they? Maybe it's the, the fear that by showcasing somebody else's expertise, you're somehow pushing business away. But I've never bought into that. I've never bought into that. That's why I always have guests on my own podcast. And let's face it, when you're interviewing people, not only are you giving great content to your listeners, but you're also learning something yourself simply by having that conversation. No, absolutely. So finally, build your own private amplification group. Mm. And what Rand is arguing is that don't try and scale this to the point where you know you have big numbers you might find that actually the success and how your sales funnel is going to be fed in is by simple and small scale operations so to have a small private amplification group that is looking out for you and watching your back is going to be so much more helpful to your business than a large group of connections that frankly don't pay attention to what you do so listen there is there is so much more in this article from Ranch Fishkin but I'm just so pleased that for once the algorithm managed to present his article to me via Twitter and to give you a quick summary today. That's fantastic, Pascal. I will definitely be reading the whole of that article after we've finished recording this show. So shall I tell you about my piece of content? Please. Now, this is actually a very old piece of content. It goes back to 2006. Uh, but there's a specific reason why I wanted to bring this up today. Now, this is a TED talk that was given by a gentleman called Sir Ken Robinson. And this TED talk has been viewed over 66 million times. 66 million, Pascal. And, and, and the reason it's been seen so many times is because it is amazing. It is one of the best, if not the best, TED talk that has ever been made and it's obviously a 20 minute conversation it's very funny not only are the messages that Sir Ken puts across in the in the TED talk phenomenally interesting and pertinent even now nearly 15 years later but his TED talk is a master class in how to put together a talk it's very funny, it's well structured, and the points that he makes just emerge from the, the stories that he tells. And I've watched this speech many, many times, and I was prompted to watch it again over the weekend for the very sad, simple reason that I saw on Twitter that Sir Ken Robinson died oh. over the weekend. Um, very, very sad, very, very sad. And it just prompted me to go back and watch this talk. Now, the talk is called Do Schools Kill Creativity? So Ken's background has been in education and he's often, and he, he holds this contention that because we, we have curriculums, because we have 
things that we want to teach children this is not just in the uk this is across the entire world that we we have we effectively kill the creativity of our children by effectively forcing them to learn in a certain way forcing them to learn a certain amount of knowledge and then we force them to be tested in a certain way and 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 he and he uses stories of of young kids who are so creative in when they're writing and they're drawing but as they progress through school whilst they're level of knowledge might increase their creativity is almost squeezed out of them and he's very disparaging of the world's education system for allowing this to happen and, and this ted talk basically lays the cards on the table and says this has to change uh so i watched it again over the weekend and, and it made me laugh i was sad but it made me laugh and and of course he, he did two more he did one in 2010 and one in 2013 which have been watched equally millions of times and both of those follow on from the first equally funny equally master classes in how to give a great talk so if you've never heard of ken robinson please go and watch these this talk if you have heard of ken robinson and, and you didn't hear the sad news please go and have another watch. Do you know, um, well, sad news to begin with, but what a proof that sometimes recency of content is not always you know, uh, equal quality. Yeah. And I think there's a yeah. um, dis miscommunication or misinformation in the world of content marketing where unless it's recent, no one's going to pay attention to it and, yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And there's some hesitation sometimes in people promoting content that would deem to be old or older. With regard to creativity, what is absolutely crazy is, of course, when you go into the world of work, your team leaders, your bosses, your managers want you to be creative and mm -hmm. solve problems, whether they are content marketing problems or engineering problems or kind of team performance problem. It's usually those with imagination, as you know, a favorite keyword when it comes to marketing that um, we, t we turn to. And, and I think, you know, this disconnect between the world of education and business continues to this day. Interestingly, what um, Ken spoke about in this TED talk was echoed by um, Sir Ridley Scott at a recent mm. presentation he gave. It was an awards, I think, ceremony, uh, and he was talking about education, and as well as um, Ken Russell, I'm going to say. His surname is another film director. So... Yes, and in a world of online communication, which has become so much more visual and, and audible, if, you, if I could use the term, Roger, those yeah. with creative minds are going to be obviously well sought after. So can you imagine you know, what kind of professional you, you would become if you had the skill set required for your particular function, but also you have creativity? And, and I think we need to find a way to communicate that key message to the world of education who are perhaps m missing some of that point. Because I certainly would argue that both in France and in the UK where I've been educated, I don't remember being encouraged to be creative as such. Do you? No, I think that, again, it's not just schools. It's often corporates as well. The processes and the bureaucracies that we build into these institutions often stifle the creativity. I've worked with many clients who've said, our team aren't creative enough. We want to help our team be more creative. And actually, once when you've worked with them for a while, you realize that it isn't the staff that are the problem. It's the processes and the bureaucracies that they've built around those staff and if you can free the staff from those processes and bureaucracies then their creativity does shine so i think sometimes when it comes to creativity you've got to look at what surrounds it what your your processes and bureaucracies are otherwise your creativity might be stifled i think also roger is in some businesses large and small the the culture is such that testing and finding out what works through iterations and, and essentially having to sometimes look at something that does not work is, is in, gets in the way. You know, being right first time or being correct all the time, which starts at school, I would argue. You know, we mm. all get grades. I mean, mm. we're going to be careful about grades at the moment. I'm making the headlines for all the wrong <laughs> reasons. But you get a grade for getting it right or wrong. You don't get grades for actually trying a different way of doing something or a different way of expressing something. So I know that some businesses are doing very well when it comes to creativity um, but others are not as much so well thanks for that roger really great fantastic reminder so let's move on to marketing tech 
Welcome to Marketing Tech and Apps. This is the part of the show where Pascal and I choose one or two pieces of technology. Could be an app, could be a platform, could be a website, and we share it with each other and with you, the listeners and the users. So Pascal, you're in the firing line. What have you got for me this week? So this week, Roger, I'm going for visual expression creativity okay. we just mentioned that a moment ago so you'll be familiar with a platform called canva perhaps no yes <laughs> so i wanted to kind of explore other options because the risk and the danger of course is that eventually um people on the web play the game of spot the canva created yeah. uh, visual and there's nothing wrong with that what i would say actually about canva before i move on to my solutions roger is the platform has improved really a lot for the last few weeks and few months. So for those of you who are using Canva, I would do an exercise of clicking on some of the buttons and features that you don't use on a regular basis. You may discover something brand new. But ultimately, Roger, we're here to get someone's attention. We're here to create some sense of novelty, to use the term that I use with uh, Ranch Fishkin's uh, article review. And I've got two platforms that can allow you to look perhaps a little different. The mm -hmm. first one is concerned with speed of execution. And sometimes all of us have to work a bit faster. And Buffer, which is known for the social media kind of um, publishing platform and scheduling platform, has a discrete product called Pablo by Buffer. That's the full name, Pablo, as in Paul in Spanish. Pablo by v Buffer is a very, very simplified version of what Canva for, can do for you. You can create visuals for social media using portrait, landscape, and square formats. You can add photography. You can add text. But the interface is so simple that you work very, very fast. So if you need some time to a bit more discipline and structure, Roger, with uh, your activities online, I would consider Pablo by Buffer. Now, on the other side of the scale, sometimes you just do something a bit more involved. I'm going to say an infographic or a visual story. And there's a platform called Visme, V-I-S-M-E, visme.com. And it allows you, using, again, a dashboard, which is very usually uh, user-friendly, to create some pretty, pretty detailed infographics, often based on data, as well as key concept. They have a multitude of icons. You can use different colors, and so on and so forth. And they have, of course, a free and, and paid version. But what is nice about Visme, the style, the colors, and the iconography is very different to Canva. Mm. You can you could not actually um, get confused. And, and I thought that was just a nice little addition to someone's toolkit to have visme.com on one hand for infographics and visual stories and Pablo by Buffer, which again will look very, very different. So there you have it, different ways for visual expression. Well, I definitely use Canva uh, a lot. So I'm probably one of the people who should check out these alternatives, Pascal. So I, I've got a similar theme this week, all actually. Right. It's all about, again, stuff that you can use in your content. Now, very early on when I was doing vlogging, I uh, came into, got in myself into a little bit of trouble. And, and it was a bit inadvertent in that I'd been speaking at a conference. It was actually the Youpreneur Summit, um, which uh, we know and, and love. Uh, Chris Duck is a, a friend of ours, well, more a friend of yours than, uh, than mine, I suppose. You've known him for many, 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 many years. Um, but I, you were very kind at that uh, conference to film me when I was on stage. And I included within my vlog the bit where I walked up onto the stage after Chris Ducker had introduced me. And literally in the vlog, it was about eight seconds. But Chris had been playing a piece of music in the background at the conference. And YouTube picked up on that piece of music instantly and gave me a copyright strike. Now, I, I thought there was something called, um, you know, you, you had a bit of leeway for maybe 10, 20, 30 seconds for, for copyright stuff. Fair usage, I think they call it. But no, I got absolutely clobbered. And it made me realise how important it is to make sure that music you use in videos is not copyright or and there are no royalties to be paid. Um, now, you can get royalty free music from youtube but it's not a massive collection and i've been using for the last couple of years something called epidemic sound love the name of that epidemic <laughs> sound and and you, you pay for it it's about 90 pounds a year um, but whilst you're paying for it 
you can use their music in perpetuity. So even if you join Epidemic Sound for one year and you use a load of their music during that year in your videos, it's yours forever for that video, as long as it was created during the time that you were a member of Epidemic Sound. And, and you know, some of this music that they have is so well produced. I have actually started listening to some of it almost like I would on Spotify. I see an album by a, an artist on Epidemic Sound and it's as good as a mainstream artist. And in fact, they've just started publishing their stuff on Spotify. So you can listen to Epidemic Sound stuff as legitimate music on Spotify. That's why I love it so much. There's some great stuff on there. Second thing is a website called Unsplash. And Unsplash is all about photographs. And this one you don't have to pay for. It's totally royalty free. Now, as you know, Pascal, I'm not a big fan of massive PowerPoint presentations, especially those PowerPoint presentations that are heading bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. I tend to like to have a photograph with maybe one or two words on the slide. And sometimes, you know, finding photographs to use in slides can be a bit of a pain and, and a lot of them look very staged and very you know just too corporate or, or 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 too cheesy unsplash is effectively just photographers like you and i who are taking photographs on either phones or decent cameras and you can just find whatever you need put it in your powerpoint presentation and you don't have to worry about anybody getting you for copyright theft or anything like that. And there's some really, really good stuff on there. So epidemic sound for music, unsplash for photographs. Superb. And I can see why you would suggest that it was similar to my kind of theme of being mm. different or surprising mm. your audience with something different. Can I just check with the epidemic sound? Do they give you access to, you know, sometimes what you need is just like 10 seconds for an intro uh, element of a video. Sometimes you need something much longer. Do they have different length or there's usually one track for you to edit down as you see fit? Well, you can do whatever you like, Pascal. Most tracks are available as um, an instrumental only then there's there's usually one with vocals there's usually what they call a sting version of each track as oh, well right which is, yeah, yeah. is usually about between 10 and 20 seconds long um so i do use the stings quite a lot as well but i will often just edit the music down into the video anyway or sometimes i'll use the instrumental version of the song during the video and then at the end when i put my sort of end credit on i'll actually use the vocal version so that it's the same piece of music but it just sounds different mm. and, and what you can also do which i really like is that you can you can actually download the track either in its entirety or they'll set they'll download it by layer so you get the drum track you get the guitar track you get the keyboard track you get the vocal track you get whatever the whatever the tracks are you can get them separately so if you just want the drum beat you can get the drum beat if you just want the guitar riff you get the guitar riff or you you get the whole track so it's it's really well worth investing that 90 pound a year to get access to such great content you're absolutely right because actually one of the things that i do recommend when i get involved with video marketing consultancy is that the music you know becomes a signature for mm. who you are what you stand for mm. but so often the audience just needs a hint that's what they do of mm. course in uh, film production you can you could be watching you know a film if we use for example um the recent picard series with with star mm. trek you know sometimes it's just the drums here or just this but it all kind of brings, you know, the whole universe together. So I'm, I'm impressed, Roger. I mean, for, for, the, for what they're charging to give you all those layers and, and split the, the tracks and so on, it's just incredible. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. But for content creators, it's an absolute dream. So, Pascal, it is time for us to go back in time <laughs> for This Week in History. So let's go back in time. It's time for This Week in History. Pascal, do you want to kick us off with the first date? All right, then. In 1831, English scientist Michael Faraday discovers electromagnetic induction, the primary principle behind all of today's electronic technology. 
1897, Thomas Edison patents the kinetoscope, a device designed for films to be watched by one individual at a time through a viewer window at the top of the device. In 1956, the IBM 350 Disk Storage Unit Model 1, Roger, is announced roughly the size of two fridges and around 1,000 kilograms in weight. The 350 could store, wait for it, between 4 to 5 megabytes of data. Wow. Wow. In 1959, the post office introduces new direct dial payphones in the UK. The public phone boxes were inaugurated in Bristol by the Deputy Lord Mayor who phoned the Lord Mayor of London without the need for an operator. In 1976, The Muppet Show, created by Jim Hansen, premieres in the US with Maya Faro as the first guest star. Six years later, Jim Henson co-directed The Dark Crystal with Frank Oz, the voice of Yoda. In 1985, the first pictures of the wreck of the Titanic were released, 73 years after the liner sank by a joint American-French expedition led by explorer Dr. Robert Ballard. Now, in 1995, auction site eBay is launched by Pierre Omidyar. First started as a hobby, the site was called Auction Web, and the first item ever sold was a broken laser pointer. Uh, in 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin file incorporation papers for a now well-known search engine called Google. The name of the search engine comes from a misspelling of the word Google, which is the number one followed by a hundred zeros. So, this week in history, Pascal, The Muppet Show. <laughs> the Muppet Show. Yes. I mean, the, the, the Muppets are part of our culture, aren't they? And, and unfortunately, these days, we tend to use the term Muppet to describe somebody of questionable intelligence. <laughs> but, it, it, some, you know, you have to realise that the incredible part of our culture that they are starting with sesame street and, and you know we talked about education and creativity earlier on with ken robinson but you know sesame street was so good to be there for the for the younger children to learn as they watch tv and then of course i remember the muppet show being launched in the 70s and I think it, it was actually a British produced show. I think London Weekend Television was the, was the, was right. the producers of the show. But because obviously the main audience for the show was in America, the majority of the guests, certainly in the first season, were American guests and i remember sitting down and the muppet show would come on and, and kermit would go it's the muppet show and this week our special guest is ruth buzzy and my my dad's sitting there with me and he goes who the bloody hell's ruth buzzy and and that was because most of the guests in those early shows were americans and we'd never ever heard of them no, I mean, they even had uh, people like Prince and Michael Jackson and, yeah. I mean, you, you name it. And it was, I, I believe that, you know, most celebrities wanted to be on the Muppet Show. You know, they, it wasn't like something that people uh, looked down upon. But uh, you know, Jim Henson, I think, was um, behind Labyrinth and mm -hmm. Fraggle Rock for memory, if memory serves, and many other kind of um, creatures. And they were so, so human-like and alive. Uh, did you have a favourite character or maybe some characters as part oh, of the Muppet Show? I, I think, I think it, and you would probably expect this to be the case, I just love Pigs in Space. <laughs> um, I mean, it was obviously a, a take on Star Trek, wasn't it? What was it? It was, the, the, it was Captain Link Hogthrob, uh, and, and obviously Miss Piggy was the uh, was the first mate, and there, there was... There was Doctor Strange Pork as well, I think. Uh, it was it was just great fun, wasn't it? It was just great fun. Absolutely. Um, and obviously, The Dark Crystal. I mean, when we went to see it at the cinema in France, and uh, honestly, I never seen anything like it. Um, and then, of course, years, years later, they uh, cooperated and worked on the Star Wars franchise. It's just um, such a contribution to popular culture uh, at all ages. But, I mean, The Muppet Show was in France, I would say, in the 80s, and it took a while for things to be, obviously, uh, translated and to have voiceover acting. It was done superbly well, and the show was on Sunday afternoon on French TV. And it was yeah. like the highlight. It was just the whole family was around it. 
the one I always remember was uh, a little little frog, a little green frog called Robin, who was sat halfway up the stairs, and he sang a song which I think was called "Halfway Up the Stairs Is the Place Where I Sit." <laughs> I always remember that childhood memories, childhood memories. So Pascal, that's enough history. Shall we talk about our creator shoutouts? Let's do that. This is the part of the show where we give shout outs to creators, people from our network or not necessarily in our network who've put together great content, whether it's an article, whether it's a podcast, whatever it might be. Pascal, you're in the lead. Thank you very much. So I've got two content creators that I've chosen today because of the way in which I reacted and have felt when I spotted their content. Now, the first is a gentleman that you mentioned a moment ago, Monsieur Chris Ducker. Mm. So now Chris is obviously the founder of the Upreneur Academy and the Upreneur event. He is also the host of the Upreneur.fm podcast, the author of Virtual Freedom and the Rise of the Upreneur. It's just the voice again of reason and taking action when you want to build a personal brand. He recently went live on social media with the following title, Why Every Entrepreneur Needs to Hire a VA ASAP, exclamation mark. And the reason why I chose it, I suddenly felt myself delighted that Chris went back to its source, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. Roger, you know. So Chris will be able to give you superb advice on all manner of, you know, all the different facets of running a business, particularly online. But when it comes to building a virtual team to help you build a business, there's nobody like him. And for me, it was almost like the perfect you know, kind of con convergence of passion, profession, and performance. Now, Chris has spoken about uh, VAs and all the things that comes with it with, uh, for, for some years now. But what I thought was interesting, and maybe it was an important reminder, is just because you have spoken about a subject matter for some time doesn't mean that you have to do, just move on and leave it behind. You can always go back and bring value. And I have to tell you, I've heard and seen Chris talk about you know, the benefits of a virtual team or virtual assistant for quite some time. And yet, it still had unique ways to explain it. It had uh, some new information to share with the audience. And it was also very thorough. And I don't know, I just felt delighted for him. And, and I think that's, that says a lot about, again, how you can sometimes, as a content creator, want to move on or pass on the subject that you've, you believe you've spoken about for quite some time. But actually, you might find your audience is delighted for you to revisit, you know, that subject matter. So, Chris Ducker, you know, uh, I was just so pleased. And the second person that where I reacted the same, this element of delight to see them talk about a subject that they really master well, is a lady called Victoria Fleming. Now, Victoria Fleming is the founder of Buzztastic. She's a sales performance coach and mentor, and she has such energy that she can help you change and innovate your sales approach and actually take pride in selling your products and services. And what Victoria has done is do some kind of small bite-sized bit of content via video and tackling sales issues or sales concerns that people have very directly. She's literally addressing you via the, the lens. Um, recently, she's done things like how to ask for sales referrals without sh pretending to be, or without sounding needy. Do you find talking about price tricky? Should I leave a voicemail message when ringing a customer? If you want to have a conversation, but they want you to put it into an email, what should you do? So she's going really, really precise in some of the challenges of sales and selling. And again, she's done so for so many years now. I, I, I lost track very much like Chris about how long she's been talking about sales and selling, but she's going back to it. And again, bringing passion, profession, performance with something that is really, really high impact. But for me, I'm so delighted for them to talk about something that they know so well. Do you know, Victoria is the polar opposite of some of those people we were talking about earlier who just bombard you with emails and, and messages and buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. You know, she is a 
true sales professional, but she makes it engaging. You know, you, you never have that element of sales sleaze with Victoria. I, I just love her stuff. I just love her stuff. Great. So what have you got uh, for me this week then? Okay, so... I'm st- actually, there's a bit of a theme running through this. Last week, I gave a shout out for someone whose podcast I'd been on, and I thought I would do the same this week. So this week, I'd like to give a shout out for a gentleman called Richard Roger. Uh, so his uh, surname is the same as my first name, except he spells his with a D, Roger. And his podcast is called Fireside with Vos, Vos, Vox Gig. I'll say that again. Fireside with Vox Gig for professional speakers. Now, why I like this podcast, apart from the fact that I've been a guest on it, is that I mean, there are, there are quite a few podcasts going around at the moment where quite high profile speakers are being interviewed by other quite high profile speakers. And again, it, it's like this whole echo chamber thing that I mentioned before about social media. Sometimes if you're exposed to the same people talking about the same things over and over again, you're, you actually become very narrow in your thinking. And, and I'm not taking away from the fact that some great podcasts out there talking to some great speakers, but a lot of them tend tend to be high profile Americans. They tend to be high profile American marketers. What I like about what Richard Roger does is he interviews people that I've never heard of and they're often not from marketing industry. And and that's important because if you want to become a good professional speaker, whether you're preferred subject is marketing or not you've got to learn from people who are talking about all sorts of different subjects you know whether it, whether it's climbing mountains whether it's digging holes whatever it might be you can learn from people in other industries and and, and richard has been great for me because as i said he's he's given me access to people that i would never have found myself and these people have got just as much to share as some of those much higher profile people from our own industry. So very important, I think, just to try to spread your your net a little bit wider and, li- and listen to other people giving such great tips. The second one I'd like to shout out to is Ben Afer. Now, Ben describes himself as the language strategist. And I guess that's why I have empathy with him. Uh, Because as you know, as people listen to this show will be starting to know now, I am obsessed with simplicity. I hate gobbledygook. I hate management speak. (laughs) I call it muppetry, funnily enough. (laughs) And Ben focuses down even further into language, into copy. And, you know, it's not just about using, not using jargon. It's not just about not using gobbledygook. It's using simple language that people can understand. And Ben's put loads of really good resources up on LinkedIn, funnily enough. Uh, You can download them as slide slide shares or as as articles. And, you know, it's really refreshing to read somebody who's passionate about language, but actually passionate about keeping language simple so ben afer and richard roger from me what a fine selection i would say roger you know lots there for people to get into like you say expand your network of thinkers and kind of guest and host uh, of events and, and i think i would argue that I, I can sense that you the two that you've chosen again a fine the format but also the the content that they're truly passionate about Absolutely right. Talking about stuff that we're truly passionate about, do you think we should talk about this week's film? Let's do this. Well, Pascal, here we go again. It is the film marketing section. Now, people watching the show, people listening to the show might be a little bit shocked by what we've chosen to talk about this week. Most people expect us to be talking about science fiction or horror or fantasy, but we're actually going to talk about a musical this week. Pascal, we're going to talk about Mamma Mia. Now, Mamma Mia, the reason I thought it would be a really good film to talk about was because I think Mamma Mia represents the ultimate in content repurposing. If you think about it, Mamma Mia started way back in the 70s. A Swedish group called ABBA 
won the Eurovision Song Contest with a, a song called Waterloo, and they were propelled to mega global stardom over the ensuing years. Lots of number ones, lots of incredibly catchy songs hitting the charts, great albums. And then one lady, Felidia Lloyd, had a great idea. Why don't we write a stage musical based around the songs of ABBA? Now, these days, these things are called jukebox musicals, and they're, they're pretty ten a penny. You know, we, there's, uh, there's the Queen one, which is called We Will Rock You. There was one called Sunshine on Leith. Um, there's Rock of Ages. You know, jukebox musicals are all over the world now. But back when Mamma Mia hit the theatres in 1999, this was the first time that this had been done. So Felidia, Felidia Lloyd was the producer and the, the writer of the book, the, uh, the theatre book, was called Catherine Johnson. Now, I remember going to see Mamma Mia the year it was launched. Now, in, in fact, we did corporate hospitality. So in that first year, I saw it three times. Uh, I've, seen the stage, <laughs> I've seen the stage play six times, um, Pascal. I've seen it three times in London, twice in Edinburgh, and once in New York. So I was a bit of a Mamma Mia fiend. And then, of course, the natural, the natural next progression in this content repurposing was the creation of the film and that was launched in 2008 and it was a stellar cast Pierce Brosnan, Meryl Streep, Amanda Seyfried, all sorts of others and, and it, it was just I mean it's a cheesy film glorious uh, visuals you know the, the the Greek island setting was just absolutely astonishing and of course those songs absolutely carried it and I, I remember when I went to the the first time I saw the stage version and you know the song would come in and and you almost cringed with delight at how they managed to shoehorn <laughs> the song into the narrative there was that collective oh my goodness and and of course you don't get that the second time you go to the to the uh, theater to see it but because it was subtly different in the film i guess i had that experience again so that's why i wanted to pick mamma mia to talk about this week pascal because it's the ultimate in content repurposing i i would agree now interestingly so you and i obviously are people would expect you know we talk about uh, we plan the, the podcast episodes we we discuss things when you mentioned mamma mia my mind went racing back in time 2008 where I was being centrally dragged, kicking and screaming into the <laughs> theatre. My plan, actually, Roger, I'm ashamed to say, was I'd agreed to go uh, eventually after much reluctance. And I thought, I know what I'd do when we go to the cinema. So I think we went to the Metro Centre near Newcastle upon Tyne, Gateshead, near where I live. I'll buy a ticket for a different film. The rest of them can go and see Mamma Mia, and I will go and see something far superior. When we arrived, there was nothing else to, to, to kind of buy a ticket for. I sort of the timing was slightly off. And Mamma Mia was on so many screens that eventually I went in and I had a wonderful time watching mm. this film. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, when I was offered to go to see Mamma Mia, I went, hmm. So, of course, I did my movie nerd thing of checking, you know, who was director, who the cast were, and so on. I didn't know the director much, but that's understandable because her work has been primarily stage and small screen. But I have to say, Meryl Streep, I thought, well, hang on a minute, she's not going to be involved in a bad project. Stellan Skargaard, Colin Firth, you know, Piers Brosnan, Julie Waters, Christine Baranski, who is one of my kind of favourite comedian from the US. Um, I went, well, I can't, there's nothing else to go and see. I sat down and it begins. And you're right, the cinematography was stunning. The way the song were weaved into the storyline was very, very clever. But I have to tell you, I really got it. I would say I enjoyed the whole film, but I got the the spirit of the film at the end with these crazy closing credits when yes. they appear on stage dressed essentially like 70s ABBA look and they all were essentially doing some kind of karaoke uh, session. The hall of the theatre room were up dancing in the yeah. aisles and yeah. so on and so forth now what was interesting this was essentially leading up to i think we went in the autumn uh, for memory 
Now, bear in mind that this has been on screen for quite some time, and I thought, what a feel-good movie to kind of help you start the end of your festivities. So I am a um, reluctant, if you like, you know, fan <laughs> of the movie. But I agree with you. What a lesson in repurposing. But also what I think the lesson is, is to also, so if you want to repurpose content, Roger, invite people who are truly good at the new format you're thinking of. So you may be the author of the songs in this case, but you perhaps not, obviously, you don't know what stage is like, you don't know what film production is like, you don't know what maybe a book would be like or audio book. So you invite the right people to help you take the project forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyway, I was the same when we went to the cinema to see it, they were up dancing at the end. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and even, I think Meryl Streep even says before they sing Waterloo at the end, do you want another one? I know. And, and everybody in the audience is going, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like we were actually at a live performance in the theater that it created, that, I think there was that moment I thought, this is a film. But it is almost a live performance. And, and, you know, he just came out bouncing around and feeling so good. And, and I think it was one of the highest grossing movies of 2008. Um, and, it, and it beat previous, you know, mega films like Titanic and Avatar. It was so popular. And, and yeah, the, the mainstream media just dismissed it as a cheesy rom-com with songs. And let's face it. You know, Piers Bronson can't really sing, but I, I, it didn't worry me. I just thought it was a great piece of fun. And I, it's the movie that I will watch. And funnily enough, it was actually on television last night. Um, <laughs> was it? Gently, <laughs> totally coincidentally. But it is one of those films, if you're feeling a little bit like you need cheering up, especially during the winter, mm. put it on. And that combination of the cheesy plot, the great songs, and the fabulous Greek scenery, it will just warm your heart. But I think was um, good about, obviously, how they managed it. You know, So word of mouth, honestly, was incredible. But the movie was released in and around, I think, the end of the summer. And before you know the end of the year, the DVD was out for sale. And one could be quite cynical and look at it from a revenue and sales point of view. But you know, do you remember the days where you had to wait an entire year before you could get uh, your hands on the DVD copy of a movie? I thought that was so smart that you know, kind of, whilst the audience is really on your side, go for it. And as you mentioned, the sale of the DVD went through the roof. I think you mentioned bit the the record held by Titanic and Pirates of the Caribbean back then. For me, what was also very interesting and telling was to find that, and so I've not had the pleasure like you to see the stage version three or four times, uh, but I was aware of the imagery and the calligraphy, no mamma mia, the sign, and the photography and the way in which she was presented was very clearly th their own. And they use the same kind of feel and design for, for the, the film's um, version. So the Mamma Mia typography was respected, the way in which the different actors, I think there was two versions. There was the sh poster with all of them, you know, yeah. all the cast, but there was one where they were individually kind of featured and I believe that was the same for the Broadway and, and stage show. But going back to, to the singing, for me, what I took away was there was sincerity, which is that none of them pretend to be singers, mm. but they did a very good job. And the one that I think works well, because on the edge of not working at all, is the singing between Piers Brosnan and Meryl Streep. The mm. winner's take all, I think, is yep. the title. It's just on the edge of being badly sung, and somehow... <laughs> That kind of keeps you riveted, thinking, "Oh my God, are they going to pull this off?" Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And 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 I think the sing along was was part of the marketing, wasn't it? Mm. Quite a lot of the theatres actually ran sing along versions where the words of the songs came up on the screen, so that the audience could actually sing along. Not that I think you would need the words because everybody knows the words to other songs, yeah. don't they? Um, and that would have been course... a bit too too much for me, I think, <laughs> the sing along version. But I was I was very happy um, to, to, you know, like I said. Very reluctant guy. I had a, I had a, a plan to escape and go into a different screening room. And actually, you're right. It, it was it was a blast with um with the um an audience, which sadly at the moment we can't uh, enjoy as much. And yeah, I'm pretty sure we went ahead and bought the DVD like everybody else. Yeah, we we did buy the DVD. And and here's a little admission. This is the first time that I've actually done a bit of film editing at a blockbuster level. But 
one of the songs that was deleted from the original film, the name of the game, um, was included on the DVD as a deleted number. And I actually used Windows Movie Maker to edit the song back into the film because <laughs> I wanted to see the, the whole film with the missing song. So, yeah. Okay, so apologies to everybody for choosing such... Well, actually, I'm sorry, not sorry. No, no. Um, yeah, it's a great film. It's a great example of repurposing it's great fun and as i say it can lift the mood at any time you just fancy a little bit of warm heartwarming fun well we've come to the end of another episode of two geeks in a marketing podcast i could say thank you for the music but i will say thank you for watching and thank you for listening please do subscribe and leave comments and suggestions in all the usual places. Until next time, go out there and make sure your marketing is done right. I was Roger Edwards and he was Pascal Pantoni and we shall see you on the next one.